Okay, you've all seen the headlines, right? The sun is going crazy right now. It's burping magnetically explosive plasma that's hitting Earth and causing geomagnetic storms and beautiful auroras all over the planet. But my question is, why is it doing this? Why is it doing it right now and how is it doing that? And also, how do we know that it's doing that? Like, how do we study it? So over the last few weeks, I went on a deep dive about the sun's activity. And on that journey, I got to talk to a NASA astrophysicist. She actually leads a team of researchers who study the sun for a living. How cool is that? She told me all the really cool things about where we are in heliophysics, the study of the sun today, and where we're going. You guys are gonna love this video, so let's just get into it. Okay, so this is our sun in 2019, but this is our sun in 2024. These dark things are called sunspots, and while there are a lot more this year, they're not signs of aging like sunspots on a person. These are actually really active magnetic fields, each one bigger than Earth and 2,500 times stronger than our magnetic field. Those magnetic field concentrations are even hotter than the rest of the corona. They are more magnetically active. They oftentimes will explode. Wait, wait, wait. Magnetic fields explode? This magnetic explosion that we call a coronal mass ejection when it launches that plasma out into space and the light that's associated with it is what we call the solar flare. What she's explaining is exactly what happened in May. It was actually the biggest solar storm we've seen in over two decades. Basically, this sunspot cluster popped up and started spewing magnetic fields and plasma and radiation right toward Earth, causing a severe geomagnetic storm. It did produce all those beautiful auroras, which I'm still salty I didn't get to see, but it also affected technologies. And the solar storms didn't stop there. We've seen a lot more since May and can expect to see a lot more over the next year. So why is the sun so active right now? Every 11-ish years, we go through what's called the solar maximum, where we get um, pockets of magnetic concentrations that pop up through the sun. We're in that period of solar maximum right now. That's why these two photos look so different. In 2019, we were in solar minimum, so there was far less activity. Activity. Not no activity, you can see a sunspot here, just less. Now, tracking these periods is actually quite easy. We just count the sunspots and their intensity. We've been doing this for centuries, so we have good data that shows it is roughly an 11 year cycle. But we don't know why it's 11 and not 5 or 20 or some other number. We do know that it has something to do with the dynamo, that physical thing inside the sun that actually creates the magnetic field but we don't know much more than that. Part of that is because even though we've been tracking the sunspot number for centuries, still that's a really short amount of time in a star's life. So one thing we can do is look at sun-like stars and look at their cycles, because those cycles are not 11 years, they can be shorter or longer, and see if we can understand something more general about how dynamos work. And some scientists even think that the planets in our solar system affect the sun's cycle, including Earth, which is crazy to think about because we are so small comparatively. Like 1.3 million Earths can fit inside the sun, and it is possible that our rotation around it affects its magnetic field. Whoa! Okay, so we've been talking a lot about this magnetic field, but now my question is, how do we actually observe and study it? Let me show you this cool spacecraft. This is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's been in orbit around Earth looking at our sun for nearly 15 years. And on board is this payload, the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager. This is the instrument that takes these images. It measures the strength, direction, and evolution of the sun's magnetic field, including the sunspots. And while these photos are in two dimensions, it's measuring the magnetic field in all three dimensions. Now, once the sunspots actually produce a coronal mass ejection or a solar flare, other spacecraft can take over, like this one, Stereo. Stereo was actually in the direct path of a CME during the solar superstorm of 2012, which would have been the largest geomagnetic storm in history if it had hit us. Now, thankfully it didn't because it would have wrecked technologies for years, but it's spacecraft like Stereo that help us understand and categorize CMEs before they get to Earth. Stereo also has a really unique ability to see CMEs coming at Earth from the side. The best way to look at those coronal mass ejections and solar wind that's headed towards the Earth is from the side. So I'm working on a project to take very high resolution ultraviolet images of some of these structures. When these um, solar flares happen, the extra ultraviolet and um, X-ray radiation really impacts the thermosphere and 
really can impact the satellites and their drag. Okay, satellites, my bread and butter, here's what's happening. With solar flares and CMEs comes lots of extreme ultraviolet and X-ray radiation that slams into our upper atmosphere and heats it up. And this expansion in the upper atmosphere actually increases the atmospheric density. So there are more collisions between atmospheric particles and satellites. So to counteract that extra drag, satellites have to use extra fuel, which reduces their lifespan. But it's not just drag that's a problem. The high energy particles in these solar storms can actually penetrate a spacecraft's radiation shielding and damage the sensitive electronics inside. Actually, a single particle has the ability to corrupt an entire data set or send random commands to the spacecraft. Our magnetic field protects us, our atmosphere protects us, but our assets are not safe. Our, our GPS, our satellites, they're not safe. When that radiation hits Earth, it heats up the atmosphere, but it also ionizes it. It charges it up. That increased ionization can absorb high-frequency radio waves, which are used for things like aviation, maritime operations, and even emergency services. That ionization is actually irregular too throughout the atmosphere, and that can lead to something called scintillation, which is just a fancy word that means there's a lot of variability in a signal's amplitude and phase that we don't want. Also, so solar storms can induce geomagnetic currents into the Earth's surface which then, I'm sorry, this is crazy, but it can travel into a power grid through ground connections and completely blow transformers and other electrical components. Humans on Earth are generally protected. Like you're really not gonna notice anything except maybe that GPS signal wonkiness. But above our atmosphere, astronauts do have to take shelter in the ISS. Now it's not as big of a deal on the ISS because they are really shielded by our magnetic field there, but it really begs the question, what do we do on the moon or Mars? Actually. Let's go look at Mars real fast. Something cool just happened. Okay, so that sunspot cluster that created the CMEs and the flares that hit Earth back in May also did the same thing to Mars. And I wanna show you one of the coolest videos I have ever seen. So this is the Curiosity Rover's navigation camera. And these white stripes that kinda of look like snow or glitter are not that. They're actually high energy solar particles from that solar storm. And it's the same radiation as about 30 chest X-rays. Now, of course, that's not deadly, but it is an issue. And so engineers are thinking, how do we protect astronauts from solar storms? One idea is to actually put shelters or all of the habitats into lava tubes on both the moon and Mars. So cool. So now my question is, is there a way to predict these storms and take precautions for the future? And of course, the answer is yes, NASA does everything. One piece is people who model the dynamo. Um, another piece is people who model, all oh right, this active region for sure had a CME. So then they model how that CME is gonna propagate to the earth. Other people model once that CME gets to the Earth, what it's gonna do to the Earth, what it's gonna do to the magnetosphere. But this sounds like a data nightmare, and there are some limitations and some areas for improvement. No model can do the sun's dynamo through the chromosphere, through the corona, through the solar wind, all the way to Earth. No, we just, nobody in the world, even in the biggest supercomputers can model all of that. It's not possible. Now, the piece that really touches your life is actually what happens once we figure out there is a CME and it's headed toward Earth, what happens then? NOAA has a division called the Space Weather Prediction Center, and it's the official source for space weather alerts and warnings in the United States. Now, a random thing I love about their website is that they include the solar wind speed. Like, I don't need to know that other than it's really cool, but someone one somewhere does, and that's even cooler. So if you're like me and haven't thought about solar wind in probably ages, at least before this video, here's a quick refresher. Solar wind is plasma that continuously flows from the sun. It forms in the sun's corona, where the temperature is millions of degrees. This gives the particles enough energy to blast out from the sun and escape its gravity. And then the magnetic field, which has been crucial to everything we've talked about in this video, channels it and accelerates it through the solar system. Now we know the solar wind because it gives us the auroras, but it actually travels all the way out beyond Pluto and creates this bubble-like region called the heliosphere. This heliosphere is really important because it protects us from interstellar cosmic rays. There's actually a really cool spacecraft called Punch launching next year to study this in greater detail. Punch is an imager, a white light imager, sort of like the SOHO coronagraphs, but uh, with much higher spatial resolution, much higher time resolution, and much greater coverage so that we can watch those coronal mass ejections, we can watch that solar wind coming off the sun, we can track it all the way to the Earth, and we can see 
both the large scale structure and the substructure within it. And in 2018, we actually touched the corona with a spacecraft. This is the Parker Solar Probe, and it's named after Eugene Parker, who proposed the existence of solar wind in the 1950s, and now his spacecraft is studying that very solar wind closer to the sun than we've ever been before. The solar wind itself is totally, it's chunky. <laughs> like it's, it's comes out in chunks. And so um, things like the Parker Solar Probe switchbacks, that's one of the pieces of evidence of the solar wind not just being these nice laminar flows, but really having all of the structure. It's constantly dynamic. And I've been thinking about a lot about how our sun is just an ordinary star, right? It's, it's just the ordinary sun, but it's extraordinary because it controls everything in our solar system. We humans wouldn't exist without the sun. An extraordinary, ordinary sun. I love that. So over the next year, as we see a lot more solar storms, now you know why they're happening right now, how they happen, and how we study them. If you liked this video, you know the drill. Thank you so much for your support, and I'll see you next time.